From Palo Alto, California, it's theCUBE, covering the Conference Board's sixth annual Innovation Masterclass. Hey, welcome back everybody. Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We are at the Innovation Master Club at Xerox Park, it's put on by the Conference Board, a relatively small event, but a really a lot of high caliber individuals giving really great presentations. And, and we're excited to have our next guest. He kicked the whole thing off this morning with, um, we could go for hours, we won't go for hours, we'll go about 10 minutes. With Peter Coffey, he's the VP of Strategic Research for Salesforce, been there a long time, that you're a, a media guy before that for mm. many, many years. So Peter, great to see you. It's good to be with you, thanks. So you talked about so many things. <laughs> um, so many things in your in your opening mm -hmm. statement, and I have a, a ton of notes. But I, I, let's just jump into it. I think one of the big things um, is you know the future happens faster than yes. we expected. Yep. We as humans have a real hard time with exponential growth. We We're do. just not built that way. But right. that's the way things move. And so, how do you, as as a business person, you know, kind of deal with that reality? Because because the net net is you're never going to be ready for yeah. when it comes. Well, it's not just you know humans as individuals, but the institutions and processes we've we've built. If you look at the process of getting a college degree, it's really seriously misaligned with the time frame of change. By the time you're a senior half of the subject matter in your field may be new since your freshman year. And conversely, four years after you've graduated, perhaps a third of what you were taught will no longer be considered to be current information. Someone at Motorola once said, a batch process, no matter how much you accelerate it, doesn't become a continuous flow process. You have to rethink what does a continuous flow look like, and that's a useful conversation to have, getting back to your opening actual question. When we're talking with customers, we say, what are your assumptions, your unvoiced assumptions about the manner in which you have succession of technology, succession of product, and so on? Can we try to visualize what it would look like if that were a continuous process and not a project process? And many of our partners will tell us that their most difficult conversations with their customers are about getting away from a project mentality, a succession of big bang changes into a process in which transformation is a way of life right. and not a bold initiative that right. you will you know, take a big sigh of relief and congratulate yourself on having transformed. No, dude, you've gotten your running shoes tied. Now you can begin to run, right. but you, now the hard part begins. Right. And the sun comes up tomorrow and you start, you start, you start, start yeah. to run again. Yeah. You talked on you know, big shifts come on new abundance and yes. you use horsepower. Uh, George as Gelder's an phrase, you know, errors are punctuated by a dramatic change from a scarcity to an abundance. So, so for example, horsepower right, right. or bandwidth or intelligence. So now we're coming yeah. into the era of massive big data. Yes. We are asymptotically approaching free compute, yes. free storage, yep. and free networking. Yep. So how, how do you get business leaders to kind of rethink in an era yeah. where they have basically infinite resources, and you know, it always goes back, so what would you build then? Because yeah. we're heading that way, even if yeah. we're not there today. A, a Jedi mind trick that I often use with them is to say, let's not talk about the next couple of quarters. I want you to imagine the next Winter Olympics, when they light a torch four years from now. I want you to try to visualize the world you're pretty sure you'll be living in four years from now, and work backwards from that and say, well, you know, if we all agree that within four years that's going to get done, well, there's some implications about things that we should be doing now and some things that we should stop doing now if we know that four years from now the world is going to look like this. And it helps free your mind from the pressures of incremental improvement and in meeting next quarterly goals and instead saying, you know, that's not going to be a thing in four years and we should stop getting better at doing something that's simply not going to be right. relevant. In, in that short of a time. So hard though, right? Innovator's dilemma, I mean, that's that's the classic conundrum, yes. especially if it's something that you have paying customers and you're driving yes. you know, great revenue to. Yeah. It's hard to, uh, hard to face the music that that may not be so important down the path. The willingness to acknowledge that someone will disrupt you, so it might as well be you. you. So you might as well disrupt yourself. Right. The conversation was had with IBM back in the days of the IBM PC, that they thought that that might be you know, a quarter of a million machines that they would sell, but whatever you do, don't touch the bread and butter of the 3270 terminal business, right? And they 
did not ultimately succeed in visualizing the impact of what they had done. Ironically, because they didn't think it was that important, they opened all the technology, and so things like Microsoft becoming what it is, and the fact that the BIOS was open and allowed the compatibles industry like Compaq to emerge, was a side effect of IBM failing to realize how big of a door they were opening right. for the world. You can start off a, a spin-off operation at Salesforce. We have a product line called Essentials, which is specifically tasked with create versions of Salesforce that are packaged and priced and supported in a way that's suitable to that small business. And that way you can kind of uncouple from that Clayton Christensen Innovator's Dilemma thing by acknowledging it's a separate piece of the business. It's going to be measured differently, rewarded differently, and it's going to convey itself maybe even through a different, a genuinely different brand. This is an example that was used once with um, Disney, which when it decided it wanted to get away from family and children's entertainment and start making movies aimed at more adult audiences, fine, they created the Touchstone brand right. so that they could do that without getting in the way of or maybe even polluting a brand that they'd spent so much time building. So branding is important. Right. The, a brand is a set of promises, and if you want to make different promises to different people, well, have a different brand. Right. So different, I'm shifting gears because you touched on so many great things. Okay. Uh, a really popular thing that's going on now, right, is the conversion of products to services. Yes. And, and, and repackaging your product as a service. Yes. And you, and you talked about the don't tase me bro story, yeah. which yeah. Has, has so many elements of, of fun and interesting, but I thought, the best part of it, though, was now they took it to the next step. And, and you know, we're only a stone's throw away from Tesla. A lot of innovation, but I think one of the most, you know, kind of uh, not reported on benefits of, of really these connected devices mm -hmm. and a feedback loop back to the manufacturers to how people are actually using these things, checking in from home, being able to do these updates. And you talked about how the, the Taser company now is doing all the services. Yeah. It's, well, there, it's there, not there, even there, a service. There are no, three it's aspects. To this. That's number one, awesome. taking a product and selling it at a subscription price does not turn it into a service, even though some people will say, well, see, now we're moving to a services model. If you're still delivering a product in a lumpy, change it every couple of years way, you haven't really achieved that transformation. So you have to go back into more of a sense of, you know, look at the expectation people have of the apps on their smartphones, that they just get better all the time, that the update process is low burden, low complexity, low risk, and you have to achieve that same fluidity of continuous improvement. So that's one of the differences. You can't just take the thing you sell, bill for it on a monthly subscription, and think that you've achieved that transition. The thing that the folks who were once Taser and now are Axon, of which Taser is a sub-brand, they manage to elevate their view from the device in a police officer's hand to the process of which that device is a part, which is the incident that begins, is concluded, results in a report, maybe results in a criminal prosecution, and they, they broadened the scope of the Axon services package to the point that now it is selling the proposition of increased peace officer productivity rather than merely the piece of hardware that's part of that. Right. So being able to zoom out and really see the environment in which your product is used, and this relates to yet another idea, which is that people are saying you gotta think outside your box. It doesn't help if you get outside your box, but all of the people with whom you might wanna collaborate are all still inside their boxes. And so you may actually have to invest in the transformation and interface development of partners or maybe even competitors, and isn't that a wild idea? Elon Musk at Tesla open-sourced a lot of their technology with a specific goal of growing that whole ecosystem of charging stations and other things, so Tesla could be a greater success. And the comment that I once made is, it doesn't help if you're a perfect drop of artisanal oil in a world of water. You have to, you have to make the world capable of interacting with you and supporting you if you really want to grow, or else you're an oddity. You're, right, you're, right. You're, you're Betamax, which might have been technically superior, but by failing to really build the ecosystem around it, 
wound up losing big time to VHS for a while. Right, right. I may have to explain to all of your viewers under the age of 30 what I VHS was, I, and I, I Betamax was selling those. I can tell you the whole yeah. Panasonic yeah. factory optimization story, which is sure. a whole other piece sure. of that puzzle. So that's good. So I'm going to shift gears again. So you, have to, you have to look at a, a, a it, big perspective. Right, right. And you have to be prepared to forget that your excellence is your product and start thinking of that as just the, 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 the kernel right. of what needs to be your real proposition, which is the need you meet, the pain you address, the process of which you become an inseparable part right. instead of a substitutable chunk of hardware. Well, and I think too, it's in, it's embracing the ongoing relationship as part of the process yes. versus selling something to your distribution and yes. off it goes. You well, that's another aspect. You We've got whole one, right? industries where there's been a waterfall model. Automobiles were a particular example where manufacturers wholesaled cars to distributors who gave them with a small markup to dealers who owned the buyer customer. Right. And dealers would be very hostile to manufacturers trying to get involved in that relationship. But now because of the connected vehicles, the manufacturer may know things about the manner of use of the vehicle and about the preliminary engagement of the prospective buyer with the web manufacturer's website. And so improving that relationship from a feudal model or a waterfall model into a collaborative model is really necessary if all these great digital aspects are to have any right. value. Right. Right, and as and as the distribution of information, you know that that disaggregate level of of knowledge is no longer the case, it, right? There's well, it's so scary how more. easy it is to do it wrong. IDC just did a study about the use in retail banking of technology like apps and websites, which that industry was congratulating itself on adopting in ways that reduce the costs of things like you know bank office hours. And yet JD Power has found that the Result is that customers no longer see differentiation among banks, are less loyal, more easily seduced by $50 to open a new bank account with direct deposit. And so innovation's a vector, and if you aim it at cost reduction, you'll get one set of results. If you aim it at customer satisfaction improvement, you'll innovate differently and ultimately, I think, much more successfully. Right, right. So we're almost out of time, Peter. I want to go down one, one more path with you, which I love. You talked a lot about visualization. You brought up some, some old maps and really talked about context, right? Yes. In the right context, this particular visualization is, sure. is, a, is a value. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's a lot of conversation about visualization, especially with big data. And, and, the, and, it, and something I've been looking for, and, and maybe you've got an answer, is, you know, is there a visualization of a billion data point uh, data set mm -hmm. that I can actually look at um, the visualization and see something and see the insight. Because most of the ones sure. we see that are examples, they're very beautiful yep. and it's a lot of kind of compound shapes going on. But, yep. it's, but to actually pinpoint an actionable something out of that moray, oftentimes I don't see it. I wonder if you have any good examples that you've seen out there where you, you can actually use visualization mm -hmm. to drive insight from a really, really big data set? Well, if a big data exercise produces a table of numbers, then someone's going to have to apply an awful lot of understanding to know which numbers look odd. But a billion points, to use your initial question, well, what is that? That's an array that's 1,000 by 1,000 by 1,000. Uh, we look at 1,000 by 1,000 two-dimensional screens all the time visualizing a three-dimensional 1,000 by 1,000 cube is something we could do. And if there is use of color, use of motion, superposition of one over another with highlighting of what's changed, what people need most is for their attention to be drawn to what's changing or what's out of a range. And so it's tremendously important that people who are presenting the output of a big data exercise go beyond the high resolution snapshot, if you will, and construct at least some sense of A, B. Back in the ancient days of astronomy, they had a thing called a blink camera, which would put two pictures side by side and simply let you flip back and forth between the images. And the human eye would, turned out to be amazingly good. There could be thousands of stars in that picture. The one dot that's moving and represents some new object or some new, or the one dot that suddenly appears, the human brain is very good at doing that. And there's a misperception that the human eye is just a camera. The eye does a lot of pre-processing before the, it ever sends stuff to the brain. And understanding what human vision does, it impressed the heck out of me the first time I had a consultation on the big data program at a university where the faculty waiting to meet with me turned out to be from the schools of computer science, mathematics, business, and visual arts. 
and having people with a sense of visual understanding and human perception in the room is going to be that critical link between having data and having understanding of opportunity, threat, or change, and that's really where it has to go. And right. so if you just ask my, yourself, how can I add an element of color or motion or something else that the human eye and brain have millennia of evolution to get good Training. at detecting? Do that, and you will produce something that changes behavior and doesn't just give people facts. Right, right. Well, Peter, thank you for, for taking a few minutes. We could go on and on and on. Happy and, to uh, do chapters two, we'll three, to, and four we'll anytime you like. chapters two in the new yeah. tower, uh, in the new tower downtown. Any old time. <laughs> All Thanks right. so much. Thanks for stopping by. My pleasure. He's Peter. I'm Jeff. You're watching The Cube. We're at the Master Innovation Class at Xerox Park, put on by the Conference Board. Thanks for watching.